Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries, and uh, I want to talk to you about, you must pay close attention. That's what the scriptures say. You know, just looking at the church and looking at everything that's going on in this world, and seeing how everybody's kind of freaked out, like getting caught off guard, it's kind of evident that people have not been paying attention to what the scriptures say. So, let's look at some things this morning of what we should be paying attention to. Here in 2 Peter, <clears throat> chapter 1, it says, For we must, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So first off, we see Peter writing, you know, hey, this is real, okay? This is stuff we need to pay attention to. We need to get into our soul and our spirit. He said, well, it wasn't just making up cute little stories just to tickle your ears, you know? He said, we saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majest majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John went up with Jesus and he was transfigured. His, his innermost glory came out of him and shined and they fell on their faces. And then Moses and, the, and Elijah came and talked to him. And then the voice of God said, This is my beloved son, who am I well pleased, and so forth. That's what he's talking about. So he said, I want, We wasn't just telling you a cute story. We actually saw the power of God manifested on Jesus Christ. And so he wants us to pay attention. Let me give you the next scripture. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your heart. So what is all of this about? Well, the prophets spoke about things to come. Well, they spoke about Jesus coming, and they talked about how he would die on a cross, Isaiah 53, and, and the other scriptures in Micah and so forth. And Ezekiel talked about the rebuilding and the coming together of the new temple, second temple, and on and on. It was a lot of prophetic word, especially on the end times, like the book of Daniel. And the prophet's word is like a light shining into darkness. And, you know, we don't understand. We don't know what's coming. That's why people are freaking out and, and uh, you know, getting their hearts are failing them because of things coming on the earth. It's because it's darkness. They don't understand. Well, the book of Revelation is a prophetic word that's given to us. It's telling us about <clears throat> terrible things that's going to come. And there's warnings in the Bible towards his God's people in the church and so forth that are in the word of God and the prophets wrote about these things and and this is like a light a lamp looking into the future looking into the darkness in the places we don't understand and we got to keep on reading them and the Holy Spirit will bring light to them and the more that he brings light until the day dawns now think about this the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts what is he saying well, just like the day dawn, the morning star, the, the sun rising in the morning, the darkness of night fades away. Now, you know, just that little bit light of the moon is now being replaced by the light of the sun. You know, so he's talking about until that, that effect begins to come up inside of our spirit and understanding begins to come. And all of a sudden you say, oh, I understand now. Now I know what they was talking about. Like Jesus said... In uh, John chapter 3, he was saying that, you know, um, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Well, then it wasn't until the outpouring of the Spirit that that darkness, that we did not, they didn't understand what he meant by that, was revealed that on his resurrection, that he was talking about his body. So now we know in Scripture it says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You see, we have that, that understanding now. And there's deeper understanding going on of all the words that have been spoken by the prophets. Many of those words have come to pass. 
but many more have yet to come to pass. And, that, and that's what uh, Peter's writing is that the Holy Spirit will reveal it day by day and that, that awakening and that light beginning to grow inside of us of understanding. So we need to pay close attention to what is written in the Word of God. And not just casually read it, oh, that was about, you know, that was about things that took place 2,000 years ago, you know, but yet these things are yet to come. And he said, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit when they spoke from God. So he said, above all the things understand, that the prophets wasn't just saying things off the top of their heads. They actually were being moved upon by the Holy Spirit. And the scriptures are there for our admonition on the things that are coming on the earth. They're there to, to get us into right perspective. And make us put away those sinful natures. Put away those childish things. Youthful lust and all the stuff. Just put that all away. Man, we're living in the end times. We're living in a time frame when... Man, we need to get serious with God. Not that any other time frame they shouldn't have, but even more so in the hour that we're living in. There's all kinds of stuff going on right now. There's videos out that they have a man in Israel that they are claiming to be their Messiah. And he's supposed to be doing healings and so forth. It's on the internet and you can see, you can see him, the guy that they're claiming to be the Messiah. You know, whoa. That's a pretty strong thing that Israel is going to begin to follow. He's getting thousands of people following him all around. And he has memorized the Old Testament Torah. And, uh, and, and there's other things that he's doing. Well, Jesus warned us that they will come in my name, saying that they are he, that they are Jesus, the Messiah. And we need to know that this is a lie. Um, their Messiah came 2,000 years ago and they crucified him and he rose again. His name is Jesus, or Yeshua HaMessiah in Hebrew. He's Jesus Christ the Lord. And we just, this time of the year, especially at Christmas time, they, we don't worship Santa Claus. We worship Jesus, who was sent to the earth as a gift. And that gift was a, as a child, and he grew up, and he went and did all the fulfilling of the prophecies about himself. So, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit moved upon these prophets. So let's look at something. The, in the end times, all restraints will be loosed. Everything that's holding back wickedness is going to be removed. And wickedness is going to abound. Terrible things. But at the same time, anything that's restraining us as the church from moving into the latter rain, that's going to be loosed also. See, there's going to be a balance that's going to be taking place. In the end times, all restraints will be loosed. Now, 2 Timothy Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be, there will be, ve it will be very difficult times. Well, that's what we live in. And he's telling Timothy, you know, hey, you need to, you need to get focused, man, because we need to get this word out. And the word was written. Now it's for us and the ends of the earth that times are getting very difficult. And now it's time for us to look at these scriptures and understand what Paul was telling Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, he said, They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. There will be people on the scene telling us, Oh, we have to, you know, we have to keep the law, and we have to do this, and we have to do that. And they'll be quoting stuff out of the old covenant and, and telling us all kind of crazy things that we need to follow. <clears throat> but those things, those things will not bring forth the power of God because these people are rejecting the power of God, the new covenant. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, filled us with the Holy Spirit. So Paul's telling Timothy, you know, we need to be aware of this kind of stuff. So how much more of it you told Timothy, how much more should we be aware of all this stuff? Let's look at some things this morning. The church has been invaded so the church has been invaded. I mean, man, I watch things on YouTube and I see this, this uh, group over here fighting against this group over there. I've said this so many times. 
Uh, there's videos out there on, um, you know, speaking the, the right name. You know, his name is Yeshua Hamasiah and uh, talking against Jesus Christ. You know, you're not going to change all of this stuff that's been, that's been here for 2,000 years. You know, when I, when I pray and call him Jesus, I'm talking to Jesus, the Son of God who died on that cross. I'm not talking about some devil or whatever, you know, that they're trying to teach. You know, I think all of these teachings are getting more confusion in the church. I think we need to understand that God is looking into your heart. And, he's, and when you call on him, he knows exactly who you pray into. The church has been invaded. And there's a lot of confusion going on today. But let's look at some things in the church here in Jude, the book of Jude, a little one chapter book right before the book of Revelation. And he said, in, began in verse 3, Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. So he, he's writing so that we might defend the faith. You know, we make a stand on who the Savior is, who died on that cross. And we, make, and we defend the faith by living a holy life, by being ready to rebuke those that are going astray. Now, these people that are out there that are talking about coming, you know, bringing people back up under the law and all, they think they're defending the faith. Well, everybody out there on, on YouTube that's preaching the, the Bible or whatever, they think they're defending the faith. But what is a true defense of the faith? A true defense of the faith is to know the teachings of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about to keep the law like he did keep the law. He fulfilled the law. But to keep the new covenant, about the new covenant, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will teach us how to defend the faith. Now he said, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Paul told Timothy, they're going to have a religious view about things. But they're going to deny the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus told his disciples, don't even go out and witness until the power comes on you. And then that power came on the day of Pentecost. Well, you know, today we have churches today that have been infiltrated by that demonic spirit. And so the church is getting itself wrapped up into the things of this world. We are told to be separate from this world, Paul told the Corinthian church. And be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Yet we continue to allow the unclean things into the church. We say, oh, it's okay. God knows. He's working on us and he'll, he'll deliver us when the time comes. And there's no, there's no fighting and resisting this evil stuff that's coming in. People getting themselves involved in evil holidays and the worship of idols that we're told in, in uh, the book of Acts chapter 15 to abstain from idols. <coughs> That's the worship of something as God and not worship of the true God. So we have here that they have wormed their way into the church. They come in and they talk nice and they, they, they talk about love and they talk about giving and feeding the heart. <clears throat> they, talk, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. We're going to see that in just a minute. Here in Jude chapter 1, uh, in verse 12 and 13, we read, When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can, that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly, a double, doubly dead. For they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars, doomed forever to, to blackish darkness. So what is he saying? <clears throat> well, let's look at some things. Let's go back into those scriptures and take a look. First he said 
They are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. Now think about that. You know, you're in a boat and you're traveling along by an island or something, and then they got these coral reefs that are there. The water is very shallow. <coughs> they are like dangerous reefs because they can rip holes in the bottom of your boat, cause your boat to sink, and then you'll drown yourself because you now don't have the safety of that boat to um, to be and get you to the shore. So they are like dangerous reefs. Watch what the scripture says in Second Timothy two. He said in verse twenty three, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they gender strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are up, up in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses, and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now, He's, in these scriptures, taken into um, to light of what Jude said, the devil is the one, that's those reefs, those coral reefs. And then these people come and they say things about, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't want to go into a lot of things about the government and so forth, but they, they think we need this savior in the government. I'm not going to name names or anything like that. So they're all wrapped up onto the evil ones in the government and the one they think that should come in and make everything right and all this stuff. The devil doesn't care who you worship as long as it isn't Jesus Christ. So he's going to, to be the one to set these traps. And it sounds good, you see. <clears throat> Even the people back in the day of Jesus wanted the Romans kicked out of Israel. So they wanted a king and not, and not a suffering lamb. And so... We have this same picture here. And talking about people, people being taken captive at, at their will, at the devil's will. And they are listening to the itching words. You know, the devil said to Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, to some people, that sounds pretty good. You see, the devil's telling some people that. You bow down and worship me and listen to me. I'll give you the kingdom of the world. So as soon as they get blessed by the devil, they wind up shipwrecked. Because, see, they didn't go the distance. They didn't go past the reefs and get to the shoreline. They got snagged up out there in the water, and now their boat's sinking, and they can't make it to shore. But by the time they realize they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have did that or they shouldn't have listened to that, it's kind of like too late. Well, at least we can repent and come back to God, and then God will bring it to that shoreline. But this is what, what Jude is talking about when he's talking about being shipwrecked and being entangled and snared by the devil. You know, these people that are listening to the devil are trying to uh, cause disputes. They're trying to cause fights. You know, I listen to some of these debates going on on, the, on YouTube. And I see how it's just causing more and more confusion. I'm going to stick with preaching about Jesus and about you and I having a relationship with Him and about eternal life, <clears throat> living with Him for, forever. I don't have no time to get wrapped up in ignorant debates. You see, I'm not going to debate whether we should be having church on a Saturday or on a Sunday. I'm not going to, I don't have any time to debate you know, about things of the old covenant in relation to the new covenant. I have no time for this. You know, I'll try to talk to a person, but then if I see that person is just trying to change me, that's it. I've had enough. So I'm not going to get snagged on these reefs. I'm going to make it to the shoreline, the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Number two, they are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. You know, there's pastors out there and shepherds, but they're not, they're not good shepherds. They are uh, shepherds dressed up like a good shepherd. Like, like, um, like Paul wrote to the sec uh, Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, he said that Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers come as flames of fire. And what, do, what are they after? They're after your money. They're after your stuff. They want to be worshipped by people. They want to be high and mighty. 
They want people to pat them in, on the back and praise them for how well they know the scriptures and so forth. You know, it's a scary thing. See, I'm a shepherd, and I know, I know how, you know, when the Lord gives me something, I, I got to be careful too, like Paul said, I, you know, that I don't get puffed up. I got to give this truth to the people. You know, and I can't charge them for it. I can't preach all of that law of tithing and all just to get people to give. If they can't give out of the goodness of their heart and being led by the Holy Spirit, then, hey, I don't really want it. Oh, yeah, it would benefit me no matter how they give it. But I want them to just listen to the Spirit and give what the Holy Spirit wants them to give. That they will be led by the Spirit of God. But there are shepherds that are preaching the law. Psalm 1, it says this, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in, their, in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. You know, the righteous don't get caught up in that stuff. I mean, they're sitting in churches and they don't know that their shepherd could just be a wolf. They don't understand the scriptures because they're being taught wrong teachings. I can't help that. And I don't know how to advise people like that. But one thing I do know is that a true, a true Christian is going to be encouraged to, to, um, to bear fruit for Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is what's needed to be preached and what the church needs to grow in. And, it, and the pastor and the shepherd must lead them to good pastor. We need to warn them. That's what I'm supposed to do. Scripture says the pastor should rebuke and reprove and edify. And for, for them to bear fruit, for the edifying of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That's what Paul said to the church in Ephesus. And that's what we need to do as shepherds. You know... It's good, and, we, and I should be and have a salary. I should be paid, not by the people, but by God. He will take care of me. But it isn't my job to make people pay me. Simple as that. God will take care of me. That's what Paul teaches. But we need to obey the Lord. They, they need to keep the lights on in the church. We need to keep things, things uh, working. It will cost money to do that. I understand all of that. But we need to understand that if I can teach a Christian how to bear fruit, if I can edify them and encourage them and they change from doing bad things and begin to pray and begin to seek God and begin to spend time, well, then they'll start hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if they start hearing that voice, then they will know how to give. They will know what to do for their own life and for their own home and as well as the household of faith. They'll know who to give to and how to, to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. This is what all of this is about. You see, this is about having roots that are planted down deep into the Word of God, deep into Jesus Christ, that that truth can flow up inside of them. And they'll know. They'll know how to take care of their bodies. They'll know how to take care of their homes. They'll know how to take care of the children of God and their, and their friends and family and how to take care of the household of faith. So this is what good shepherds need to do. You know, we, we need to tell them the truth and don't put a price tag on it. Number three, they are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. That's pretty interesting. I mean, we all look outside and see clouds, but yet... We don't see any rain from them. Sometimes it looks like it's going to rain, and we don't get the rain. That's what he's talking about. Now, in Proverbs 25, 14, it says, Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. You see, they, false, they falsely say, Oh, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've given my money. And they're boasting for the praise of man. Oh, you're such a good Christian. Look at what you've done. Well, the scripture says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, whatever we do, we need to be doing in secret and in private. Sometimes it's time for a testimony, but it better be honest. It better be truthful. Because God is listening. You know, just like 
a story of Ananias and Sapphira in the Bible, in the book of Acts. They came in and boasted in front of everybody. They sold a piece of property and they gave all the money they got to the work of God. But the Holy Spirit moved upon Peter and Peter said, how could you lie to the Holy Spirit? He said, you held back some of that money. He said, I, you could have just said, hey, I gave, you know, half of what I got for that property. That would have been the truth. You see, they could have gave it as a testimony. But instead, they wanted everybody to think they were so great and so wonderful that they gave all that money that they got for that property. But they lied to the Holy Spirit and they dropped dead. The wife came in and she, and she dropped dead because she was in agreement. So the, the Lord in the early church, how powerful the Spirit was moving, took them out and put fear came upon the church. We don't have that fear today. Maybe, maybe some people need to start dying before we get that fear. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But the idea is that we can't be boasting if we really have not done it. You know, I'm sure we all have stretched the truth somewhat. I know I have. And I've been called on it. And I've had to repent. Because we can't stress the truth, to stretch it. We, we have to tell the truth, even if it's a tiny little truth. We need to not try to build it up. You know, if I'm not careful, I can do that. And I'm just being honest. You know, but I have to repent because the Holy Spirit begins to convict me. You didn't do that. What are you doing telling these people this? And I've had to repent of it. You know, so we've got to be careful that we're not uh, boasting on something. You see, there's no rain in those clouds to bless anybody with. Here in James 2, about this cloud and rain, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? <clears throat> they are like trees in autumn that are dubbed, oh, and I don't want to go to that yet. So right here we see in that it says that <clears throat> people come and they say, man, we hungry, do you have any food? You know, we, we need some clothing. And the church, the church doesn't reach out and, and do something about it. You know, are we supposed to clothe the naked, the naked and feed the hungry? But yet, say they come and we say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray that, you know, God will do something for you. And then they leave and they didn't get that need met. But if you can't meet somebody's need, that's one thing. But maybe you can get on the phone and call somebody. Maybe as a church we can definitely clean out our closet and look for those those extra shirts and dresses and shoes that we have. <clears throat> Maybe we, we can we, we have some extra money that we actually can can if we don't have any food we can go to the store and buy them some food and give it to them. There's always something that we can do, especially as a church, as a body of believers if I don't have it, maybe somebody else has it. So I can say, well, let me, let me make some phone calls. You know, we, we should never send anybody away without it. Now, it doesn't say we have to pay the electric bill. It doesn't say we have to, you know, do those kind of things. You know, but we are told to feed them if they, if they coal and, you know, give them a blanket. You know, there's just things like that that we are told to do. But right here we see that we need to put actions with our faith. It says, faith without works is dead being alone. So if I back up to it, it we're talking about clouds with no rain. So right here we're talking about faith with no works. They're hungry and we don't feed them. That's what we need to do. They are like trees, number four. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. Now it's interesting when Jude wrote this because Jesus cursed a fig tree. And the fig tree was a picture of Israel. Jesus went over to that fig tree and there was no fruit on it. Yet it wasn't time for fruit. <clears throat> but he still cursed the tree and it was plucked up by the roots. So Jude is talking about, 
these wicked people that they are like that tree. You see, they're in the church, they uh, pretend to be Christians, but they have no fruit, no fruit of the Spirit growing on them and in them, and they are plucked up by the roots. You see, God has already judged them. They need to repent. Galatians 5 says this, For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. So in, in this scripture here, and pertaining to, <clears throat> pertaining to, they are like trees in autumn, no fruit, and they've been plucked up. Right here, when you're trying to please God by keeping that Old Testament law, you become a tree without any fruit. You see, we're in the new covenant now. The fruit that we should be bearing is the fruit of the Spirit. By walking with the Holy Spirit, we should be bearing that holy fruit that we find in the Scriptures. So right here, you know, we see Paul write and say, man, when you, when you try to keep the law, now what was happening was that some people in the old Judean faith came and saw that um, they were not, the men of, of Galatia were not circumcised. And they told them, man, you're not even saved because you're not even circumcised. So then they, all the men got circumcised and then the spirit pulled away from them. And Paul wrote to them and said, well, you, don't not, you, you know, even though you don't understand what's happening to you, is that now you're trying to be righteous by keeping the law. And the law is already finished. Christ has fulfilled it. Now we are in the new covenant, covenant which is relationship. And he told, he told him, he said, y'all have ran well by faith, not by works, but now you think that you have been made righteous by doing a work, which was circumcision. And so he said that if you think that by keeping one law that you are doing right by God, think again. Because you have put yourself under the law, you've been cut off from the grace. You have fallen from Christ, from his grace. So they needed to repent. They needed to begin to do their first works over. They needed to, to forget about trying to be righteous in the things that they, that they were doing, like circumcision and, and any of the other things of the law, and begin to walk by faith in Christ. You know, I don't need a law. I need the law of love. The new covenant revolves around the law of love, not the Old Testament law. All the law was fulfilled in Christ. All of... The laws were fulfilled by Christ. So when we keep Christ, we keep the law, and then they're all fulfilled inside of us. I don't need to be commanded to love the Lord because I love Him of my own free will. I don't have to keep the law of don't, don't commit adultery because I'm in love with my wife. You see, and then all the other ones. I don't steal because I don't want to, you see, because I want to live righteous. And I don't want to keep the law to do it. I want to keep love to do it. That's what's going on here. So, they are like trees in autumn that, and that are dead, doubly dead, and they have no fruit, and they're pulled up by the roots. You see, there should be fruit, and because there isn't, they're plucked up. And those Old Testament trees have been now plucked up. Israel was plucked up. Now the church is a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Israel needs to come to their Messiah. They think that the Messiah has come right now. And they're, they're believing in this guy, and he's not the Messiah. You know, Jesus came, and he is. So we need to understand that we cannot go and... And it doesn't have to even be the old covenant law. It could be some law that you made up in your own mind. You know, pray in a certain way. That's fine, pray in that way, but don't make it a law. Don't start telling other people they have to do what you do. You understand? Because now you've made it into a law. And, you've, and you're falling from grace. You just go in and love the Lord. You know, really doesn't matter. You know, if you say Yeshua or Jesus. What matters is your heart. You know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Yeshua HaMessiah, came to earth and died on that cross. And you know who you're worshiping when you worship. You know you're worshiping the creator of all things. Number five, they are like wild waves of the sea, 
churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. It's kind of like the other one that it's turning up all their things to expose all the good things they've done. In Romans 1 it says, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their own foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So what am, what am I looking at in relation to, to this? They are like wild waves of sea churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. In other words, they know what they're doing is wrong, they still do it, and they let everybody see them doing it. They're boasting about their sins. They're boasting about their lust. They say, look, look, we st everything's good. I don't have no judgment on my life. You know, it's kind of like 1 Corinthians 5 where they had a guy who was fornicating with his dad's wife, probably his stepmother. And he was boasting about it. Nothing was happening. They wrote a letter to Paul and he said, I have already turned him over to Satan for the judgment of the flesh. That his soul might be saved in the end. I don't know what happened to the guy. But if it's the law of the harvest, what you sow, you reap, good chance he came down with venereal disease after Paul prayed that prayer, and they got him to repent and turn back. Second Corinthians, I believe, is talking about him coming back into the church. So the idea is that, you know, there's going to be a reaping on what they've been sowing. They've been so boisterous about it, they've been letting everybody see it. See, that's that turning up of that water wild waves, living a riotous life in sin, and yet going to church, singing songs, maybe even playing uh, instruments in the front of the church. they live living an unholy life at home. God's talking to them, and they need to repent, and he's given them a chance to do so. Because after a while, something is going to happen if they don't repent and turn from that lifestyle. And this is what's happening here in these scriptures. They're in the church, Number six, they are like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Wandering stars. Now, what is he making reference to? Well, here in Jude 1, 6, and I remind you of the angels because over in Revelation 12, we, talk, we see that the red dragon, Satan, took out a third of the angels. Those are angels. Those stars are angels. And so we can get the connection here and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. So what we have here is a picture. What they say these scriptures uh, connect to is back in the Old Testament and... Um, in the book of Genesis, where the angels left their first estate, came down, had sexual intercourse with the daughters of man, and produced giants, men of renown. So I'm not going to go into preaching that, but I will say that, that Jude is making mentions here of wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. And what he's making reference to is these angels that left their first estate. They're chained up in the, in the darkness down deep in the hell. And this is where they, they live in the remainder of their time, then they're going to go into Lake of Fire. But he's making reference to the people in the church that are just like these angels. They did get saved at one time, and that's why they're in church. But they have drifted away. They wandered away. They got caught up in false doctrines. They're still in the church, and they're trying to, they're trying to convince others that what they've been looking at and what they've been seeing is the truth. And things are going to change here in America. The government's going to change. Look, I don't care if the government never changes. What the truth is all about is that we need to quit wandering around and stay focused. It's on Jesus Christ. It's on the good news, the gospel. You see, quit wandering around and come back and get your feet planted. 
Leave that stuff alone. Keep yourself connected to Christ. Because it, it might not send you to hell, but it's just a warning of what happened to these angels when they left their first estate. You don't want to make disciples and preaching about the government, you know, talking to them about the government. You don't want to make disciples in that. You want to make disciples on Christ. You see? So, these fallen angels had sexual intercourse, daughters of men, produced giants. They were wicked people. God winded up having Noah build an ark and drowned them all at that time. So, it's just a warning. They're in the church. And I pray for those in the church that are trying to, to get what they know into people's heads that are not, it's not the gospel. Okay? Got to be careful. So what should we do? Jude 1, 17 through 23 says this. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love, and you must show mercy to those who faint, whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. So the way that we do this is that we've got we to keep bringing people back to Christ. Keep bringing them back to Christ. People tell me something, I try to say things like, yeah, but we, sh we know who the true king is. We know who, tr who the true government is upon the kingdom of heaven and Jesus Christ. Keep trying to bring people back. Don't let, they're wandering so far away and they don't even see it. Help them to come back. So this is our job. And if we keep focused on the Lord and worshiping and praising, and then when we come into contact with people, try to, try to encourage them with truth about Jesus. You see? That's how you keep yourself. Build yourself up in the Holy Spirit. If you speak in tongues, pray in the Spirit. If you don't, just pray prayers that are led by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for the prodigals you might pray. Lord, I pray for those that, that are off track and their focus is on something else other than Jesus Christ. You know, pray those kind of prayers. Paul said, I pray in the Spirit and I pray in my natural language. So if, you're not, if you don't have that baptism of the Holy Spirit, you don't have that evidence of speaking in tongues, then pray in English. Pray prayers led by the Spirit. So anyway, I want to pray for you this morning. I think this message is a strong message. And then um, it covered all the, these points, these six points that, um, that Jude wrote about. Peter talked about unholy, unrighteous people that have come into the church. There's a lot of truth in their warnings to us. And we need to give, keep ourselves in prayer, worshiping. You know, we need to get away from some things Quit playing games. Quit watching stuff that just leads us away. And stay focused. Read your word. Study it. And pray without ceasing, the scripture says. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray for all who are listening to this video. I lift them up to you. And I just pray in Jesus' name. I pray for them, Lord, that, that they might do what Jude wrote here. Keep themselves in the Holy Spirit. Keep themselves in truth. So I pray for them, O oh Lord. Because we are to be lights to this world, pointing the way back home for the prodigals. And pointing the way to truth to all the others. In Jesus' name, amen.